Introduction to Electromagnetic Properties of Materials. This is a huge subject, but I'm looking forward to, to getting into this because even if you want to understand other things like photonic crystals, metamaterials, metasurfaces, uh, it's absolutely critical to understand first how the ordinary materials are working. Because metamaterials, for example, they're really emulating at the macroscopic scale what's happening at the atomic scale. And so if we have a good understanding of the, the atomic scale, that'll give us a better understanding of the macroscale and also help us understand why there's some limits and some things that we can and cannot do with metamaterials. I'm also not gonna touch too much on applications of these material properties. I really just wanna list what they are, how we're characterizing them, and what's going on at the atomic scale to cause them. And, and so that's what's coming. So let's just dive right into this. Fundamental parameters. So here's Maxwell's equations. And we have the divergence equations, the curl equations. And if we stare at this for a long time, we're going to realize one thing. Where are the material properties? There are no material properties that appear in Maxwell's equations. Maxwell's equations do not tell us directly anyway how electromagnetic fields interact with materials. So Maxwell's equations are missing information. The divergence equations, we have Gauss's law, Gauss's law for magnetic fields. We have what we call the curl equations, and these really tend to be the most commonly used things because it's, it's the interaction of these two that predict waves. And we have Faraday's law and Ampere's circuit law. And, and by the way, so when, when Ampere's law was formulated, when Ampere did that, uh, this term was missing, and that was really the contribution of Maxwell and why Maxwell said to have really unified electromagnetics because he added this displacement term here, and then, of course, that predicted waves and uh, Maxwell became famous. But they're missing materials. So the materials come in through what we call the constitutive relations, and that's where we see our permittivity, our permeability, and the conductivity. So this is really describing the electric response of materials. And I might even say it's the electric fields that see the permittivity. The magnetic fields don't. They only see it indirectly through the coupling to the electric fields. And we have the magnetic response of material. Here's the permeability. And then we have what's essentially Ohm's law. Current density is conductivity times the electric field. And this is just the electromagnetic version of Ohm's law. But the fundamental parameters here are mu, epsilon, and sigma. We need those to solve problems. And so that's why I call them the fundamental parameters, but they're very limited. If I'm given values for these fundamental parameters, I really can't tell you what the effect is on the wave. Uh, they're very unintuitive that way. And in fact, if we wanna characterize more meaningful things like loss or velocity of a wave, all these kind of mixed together in this complicated soup to give us these things. But fortunately, there's a different set of parameters that are much more intuitive, and we calculate those from mu, epsilon, and sigma. And so I'll call those the intuitive parameters. But the fundamental parameters, these are the fundamental things. I just can't look at values assigned to those and tell you much about what's happening to the electromagnetic fields. So I already discussed the fundamental parameters. Uh, intuitive parameters, oh gosh, there's a gazillion of these. It really just depends on what you're doing. But refractive index, this is going to tell us about the speed of the wave and the wavelength. We have the impedance. That's really the balance in the amplitude between E and H and the phase between E and H. Uh, wavelength, velocity, wave number, propagation constant, attenuation coefficient, telling you how quickly a wave is decaying, phase constant, how quickly it's oscillating. So those are some examples of the intuitive parameters. And we would need to calculate those from the fundamental parameters. But given these intuitive parameters, like for example, uh, attenuation constant, that isolates everything about loss from mu, epsilon, and sigma all together into one parameter. And so that's why these are very nice. So the permittivity, it's a measure of how well a medium stores electric energy. And what we'll see, there's actually two ways we can have electric energy. There's energy in the field itself, but there's also electric energy that, that matter can store, and that's in the form of displaced charge. Uh, a little bit more loosely, we can just think of the permittivity as a measure of how much electric fields interact with a medium. 
And so since we're talking about storing electric energy, clearly permittivity is most closely associated with capacitance. So very often we'll write the permittivity as the product of two terms. We'll have the free space permittivity, which is 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12 farads per meter. Remember farads, that's units of capacitance. So it's the free space permittivity times a relative permittivity. So this is a factor that tells us how much greater than the free space permittivity the actual permittivity of the medium is. And so vacuum has no matter in it. That's the lowest possible permittivity. So our relative permittivity, also called dielectric constant, is always greater than or equal to one. And it has no units. All the units are conveyed by this free space permittivity. And it's a really ugly number. So this relative permittivity is a much more convenient number. So air has a permittivity of one. Actually, air has a permittivity of like 1.000000001. That I don't know how many zeros there are, probably five or six, something like that. Uh, but it's a much more convenient number to talk about. It has no units. Then there's the permeability. This is a measure of how well a medium stores magnetic energy. Again, there's two ways to store magnetic energy. There's energy in the field itself, and there's also matter can store magnetic energy. And a little bit more loosely, we can think about the permeability, just how much the magnetic fields interact with a medium. And the permeability is most closely associated with inductance, and that makes sense since we're talking about storing magnetic energy. Just like the permittivity, we write the permeability as the free space permeability times a relative permeability. So this is 1.2566 times 10 to the minus 6 henries per meter. And of course, henries is the units of inductance. And the relative permeability has no units because they're all carried by the free space permeability. And again, it's a nice convenient number to work with. It's always greater than or equal to one. And unfortunately, we don't call that the magnetic constant or anything. Uh, we still just call it the relative permeability. Then there's conductivity. This is a measure of how well a medium conducts electricity. So if something is highly conductive, has a high conductivity, then charges will pass through it very easily. Uh, low conductivity, it's going to take higher electric field values to push those charges through. We can also talk about in terms of resistivity, that's simply just one over the conductivity. Not such a big deal there. Uh, already talked about Ohm's law for electromagnetic fields, but this is where conductivity appears. The current density is the conductivity times the electric field. And of course, if we want to know the total current through a material, we really would have to add up all of this current density. We would integrate over the cross section of the conductor, but if we know the area, the cross-sectional area, then J times the cross-sectional area gives us total current. Classification of materials. We can classify materials by their conductivity. If the conductivity is very, very small, we call these insulators, or very often we'll just call them dielectrics. There's no free charges. All the electrons are bound to the nucleus. And so they resist, so they oppose current. Um, most dielectrics that we work with, they're, they're insulating. If the conductivity is very high, we're talking about conductors, we're talking about things like copper or silver, things like that. And these are materials that have a lot, a lot of electrons and they're very easily lost. And so these once they're lost, they're free to sort of float around and conduct electricity. If we apply an electric field, we can cause these to, to drift. And most metals are conducting, but you know, copper and silver are some of the more famous ones for making wires. Then in between, we have the semiconductors, and very often the semiconductors are even switchable, where we can make them more or less conductive and you know the rest of the story on that, computer chips and everything. So some really interesting materials. They're probably the more interesting materials. We can classify materials by linearity. And by that, linear materials is what we're used to. We have this constitutive relation, uh, D equals epsilon E. And this permittivity, notice when the electric field changes its value, the permittivity stays the same. Everything's kind of ordinary uh, and nothing sort of magical arises out of this. Now with nonlinear materials, notice there's more terms here now in the constitutive relation. We have our, our standard linear term, but now we have an electric field squared, an electric field cubed, 
And so as the electric field becomes more intense, the contribution of this term or this other term or any of these other terms becomes more significant. And the material properties now depend on the strength and the orientation of the electric field. And lots of interesting things come out of this. We can rectify waves, we can frequency double heterodyning and mixing, all kinds of neat things. We can classify materials by their anisotropy. So up to this point, we've been talking about these fundamental parameters as if they're scalar constants. That means if we apply an electric field E, we will get electric flux in the same direction as E, just scaled by the permittivity and a similar argument for, for B and J. However, this doesn't always have to be the case. The electric flux can be in a different direction than the applied electric field. And this happens when we apply an electric field and we push charges around. If they happen to move in a direction different than the applied electric field, then our permittivity becomes a tensor quantity and is anisotropic. And we'll be talking much more about that. So most materials are approximated as isotropic. They teach that way. And so our brains get programmed that way. And so when we hear about things that are anisotropic, it suddenly seems magical, but there's plenty of anisotropic materials and lots of cool behavior. And the big thing here is that the, what were scalar material properties now become tensors and all kinds of cool, crazy phenomenon happened. Later, we'll be talking about double refraction. That's just one thing. Uh, in general, I could say we use isotropic materials to just simply propagate waves but we use anisotropic materials to really get in and control waves and do some cool things. We can classify different types of anisotropic materials. So remember what anisotropic means. It means that the permittivity experienced by a wave will change depending on the direction of the, the fields. So uh, electric field oscillating in the X direction might see one permittivity, an electric field oscillating in the Y direction would see another. And electric field oscillating in the z direction might yet see a third permittivity. So we can think of these three positions in the tensor as a permittivity in the x direction, permittivity in the y direction, and permittivity in the z direction. Now, if these are all the same number, we're seeing the same permittivity in all directions, that's actually the isotropic case. We don't have to treat that as a tensor. That could be done as a single scalar quantity. Now, if two directions have the same permittivity, and the third has something different, that's called uniaxial. And the two directions that are the same, we'll call those the ordinary permittivities. And then the one that's unique, we'll call the extraordinary permittivity. Normally, the extraordinary permittivity is greater than the ordinary permittivities. We'll call that positive uniaxial. But when it's less, we call that negative uniaxial. And then the fully general case is when all three directions are different, and we call that biaxial. And even though we have anisotropic materials, the waves traveling through this are linearly polarized. Then we can move on to something pretty interesting called gyrotropic materials or gyrotropic anisotropic materials. And we can have gyroelectric or gyromagnetic materials. I'll just talk about the gyroelectric. And look at the tensor here. And this arises when we have something chiral. And uh, here's sort of what's meant by chirality, where you know if we reverse something, it, it doesn't look the same. Um, but anyway, uh, we can think of a spiral. And what happens in a gyrotropic medium when we inject a linearly polarized wave, it rotates. And here in these materials, the natural modes of these are circularly polarized waves. And we get things like Faraday rotation. And this is not uncommon, things like sugar, Quartz, these are gyrotropic materials, and get some really neat behavior out of those. Then there's the biisotropic and bianisotropic. So we remember our constitutive relations, D equals epsilon E and B equals mu H. Well, we now have revised constitutive relations. So our electric field constitutive relation now has a magnetic field component. And our magnetic field constitutive relation now has an electric field component. So there's an additional coupling mechanism that can couple electric and magnetic fields. And when these four numbers are all scalar quantities, we call that bi-isotropic. And of course, these become tensors, and we call that bi-anisotropic. 